So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to this our second event uh, of the year on translation and interpretation. Today we have a wonderful presentation. Uh, name is translating culture for uh, world language markets. And Melissa is going to introduce our speakers, but I want to dedicate some time to honor our sponsors. Without the sponsors, this could not be possible. And our sponsors are this venue, uh, the Forum for Scholars and Publics, uh, Duke Service Learning, our own department, Roman Studies, and, and I have to read it because it's very long, <laughs> the Mary DVT and J.H. Semar, Semens? Siemens. 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 Right. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> International <laughs> Fund. <laughs> Melly, it's your turn. Great. Um, again, welcome today. Uh, we have two wonderful speakers. Um, first, I'll introduce Mike Collins. Uh, he is a, a technical translator and a former agency owner. And then Nick Strosa has come to join us. Nick comes from Chicago, or a suburb of Chicago, Lyle, and uh, is the VP of Marketing at Interpol. So we're very excited to, to see from the agency perspective. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming both uh, Nick and Mike. Well, uh, you know, yeah, thanks guys. I'm going to start off and kind of give a, a more higher end overview of um, of what goes into translation services, kind of the, the agency perspective. Um, I will introduce you guys more to the concept of translation and global what you should be thinking about it at an early stage versus later on. And then Mike's going to go into um, take off the second half and there's more of the specifics on, on how to, you know translation, what goes into it. Um, so I think it'll be a good uh, mix. And then I think we have the Q and A. So so cool. Well, uh, again, thanks for having me and, and um, my first time on campus here. So it's it's very nice, very exciting to meet you guys. And uh, I'll start off. So the company I work for is Interpro Translation Solutions, um, high level. We're a translation services company. Uh, we've been around for 21 years. And we help different types of organizations translate different things for the global markets. So as a good transition, um, I was kind of faced with the, the, the challenge of thinking about well, what does localization mean to an agency like Interpro? What, what is it that we really do? Um, so we help organizations, nonprofits, um, people in those organizations like the marketing department, human resources, product managers, technical writers. Uh, we help these individuals translate things like their website, their documents, their software, their videos, their training, in order to do what? So what's the biggest, you know, what's the end goal? But the bottom line is we're helping these companies in order for them to successfully translate to reach multilingual speakers in their language. So, you know, the end goal of, of translation localization isn't just getting a written thing out there, it's, it's adapting to that culture and that environment and, and helping these organizations do that. Um, and that's why an accurate translation is really important. Global, why care? Should be, you know, maybe a simple thing, yes. Um, you know, most of you, I think, have a foreign language background. Um, but at some point you're going to work for a company when you graduate that most likely will be global or have global employees. Um, maybe some of you will be you know, entrepreneurs and start a company and might have to think global at some point. Um, global is important because there's more people outside of the U.S. than within. It's growing in demand and cultures around the world, countries are really interested in, in the products and services that we have in, in the U.S. So it's important to keep in mind that there is a need for what we do and translations is a lot of times the afterthought, it's like the last thing that, that organizations want to do, but you know, I want to challenge you guys to keep in mind that think about it early on in the process if you are ever um, in those positions. So, Why translate? Uh, CSA is short for Common Sense Advisory. It's a magazine publication that does research on the translation and localization industry. And they have some, some interesting facts, and, and one that I found interesting was that um, almost 73% of consumers are more likely to buy a product if it's offered in their native language. So even if they speak English very well, if it's offered in Italian or Japanese, and that's their native tongue, they're going to be more likely to you know, have a positive impression of that company and purchase from them. Um, websites obviously are global by, by nature. Um, you know, everyone can go online and, and see a website, but um, consumers are actually is that right? 82% less likely to buy if the website is not in their native language. So 
you know, just the, the, the effort that a company takes to do translations, um, assuming they do it properly, not like through a machine translation or have errors, um, can go a long way. So it's, uh, there's a lot of stats out there. These are just a couple of high-level ones, but you know, it's really, bottom line, essential for companies to think global and, and to keep translations in mind early on um, when, when targeting international, international markets. This slide, I just want to show you guys, these are the, the languages that we translate into as a company most frequently. And I wanted to uh, look, tell you a little bit more about kind of our process is we have a, a global reach, we're headquartered in Chicago, and we help companies sometimes translate one language, sometimes multiple languages, um, but it's really important to keep in mind the localization aspect of it. So if a potential client talks to me and says, I'm interested in translating my document into Portuguese. Well, my first question is, well, what, what market are you going into? Is it Brazil or Europe? Because it's, it, although similar, they're different languages. Same thing with French. <coughs> are you going into Canada or you know, the rest of the world? Are you going for Spanish? What's your target market? So uh, really to do the localization properly, we had, um, you, know, you need to have a, a, a native speaker either in that country or, or who is, is expert, expert and familiar with that, that target market and culture. So, we had a, a client come to us that was uh, very unsatisfied with the French translations that were provided, and we started to look into it, and you know, they just get feedback, well, our, our clients, our customers say that it's bad. Okay, well, what does that mean? So we look into it a little bit more. Um, it turns out that they were going into Canada, but the translations were, were not for Canadian French. So, you know, that could cause some, some major issues, even though, uh, again, like I said, it's similar, but there are, you know, nuances, and it's a, it's a different language. So. Um, it's really important to do localization correctly and uh, keep that in mind when, uh, you know, when thinking about this. Uh, I have a couple slides just to show some of the types of things that need translation that we've worked on. Um, E-learning and multimedia is basically any kind of computer-based training if you need to get certified. Um, there's video, sometimes voiceover recording that needs to be synced with like the online animations, uh, sometimes it's, it's audio recording versus subtitling. Um, a lot of times the text in most languages will expand, especially Spanish and German, uh, a lot more than the English, so the translators need to make sure that they translate in a way that it's, it's you know, going to fit and then it's formatted properly. Chinese shrinks as opposed to the English, so you know, there's more that goes into it than just the initial translation part. Documentation and what we call DTP. DTP is short for desktop publishing. Um, what that is, is is doing the layout work after translation. So like I said, a one page document in Spanish is going to be, you know, need to be adjusted because the, the text expands. Sometimes the translators have to use abbreviations or adjust the translation in order for it to fit um, in like a manual or especially like a label, like a really small label that is in packaging. You know, you don't have a lot of room to work with uh, and it could pose some challenges. Websites, I talk about websites, this is a client of ours um, that develops customized stickers. It's really neat, kind of like the fat head sticker you can put on your wall uh, or on your laptops. And uh, they have a huge global demand. And the first project they had us work on was to translate their uh, frequently asked questions on their website because they were getting consumers from around the world interested in buying products, but they had questions. So we had to do the translations of those in addition to helping them uh, translate the comments into English after you know someone was was in writing it in Japanese. Um, so there's definitely a demand for global, and like I showed in I think the back in our third slide, um, there's a lot of data out there that shows organizations are more like consumers more likely to buy if it's in their language, um, things of that nature. And, and as a really high level, the way the process works for this is clients usually will send us some kind of file or export from the website. We translate it, and then they import it back in, and then we do a test online before it goes live to the world to make sure it looks good. We, we you know, we, we go through every screen. We, you know, we adjust the buttons and things like that. So um, there's usually mo multiple steps in the process to make sure it's really accurate. And again, it's all done by by professional linguists that you know are, are experts in what they're doing. This is an interesting example to show. This is a client of ours called Visit Orlando. They're the Visitors Bureau for the, the City of Orlando, the tourism. And uh, so localization is translation. You know, we're translating the content um, for that market, localizing the text. But uh, many of our clients take the localization step to the next level, where they'll even change imagery to better appeal to that, to that market. So for Orlando, 
the research must have shown that for the Chinese market, you know, not only do the families want to go to Orlando for the world-class theme parks, but also for shopping. So there, there must have had some data that showed that. Um, versus Latin American guides shows, you know, larger families going there to enjoy the rides. Um, so we don't do that at our company. Um, it's just not our, our real area of expertise. And, and usually it's kind of hard for us to say to a client, you know, well, you should do this. And when we don't know kind of behind the scenes what they do. Um, but it's something to keep in mind that, that you know, the, the chances of families in these countries um, going there are going to increase if they, you know, if it's really localized their market. So I thought that was a neat example. How many of you guys have seen Inside Out movie? Okay. It's not that many. So basically, it's a, it's a good movie. Um, for those who haven't seen it, uh, basically, you know, I just wanted to show some, some kind of fun examples how localization, the concept of it could be, you know, in movies and entertainment and other things. The movie Inside Out is about, it's a cartoon about this uh, young girl and family that they move and you kind of see behind her emotions. So, you know, when something happens, it kind of goes in her head and there's a motion for joy, for anger, for disgust. And uh, one of the parts of the movie that's, that's kind of funny is that they try to have her eat her vegetables and broccoli and she's like, it's bad and doesn't like it. Um, in Japan, the, the research is showing that, you know, broccoli is served with a lot of meals. and. So that wouldn't really work there. They, would, they wouldn't get the point across. So they had to actually change the movie imagery to be uh, green peppers instead of broccoli to localize for that market, which would make more sense. So um, even in movies, they do that. <clears throat> the dad in the movie, he, he's kind of zoning out at, at a meal, and he's thinking about the score of the hockey game. Um, and, and pretty much outside of North America, you know, uh, soccer is the biggest sport in the world. So they had to change that to be soccer instead of hockey. So the, you know, they're changing movies and stuff. So you know, this type of thing goes a long way. Um, the movie is really good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that's interesting. Um, basically, in 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 the Middle East, they had to change the poster of the Scooby Doo movie uh, to be a little less revealing. So there's you know, for for that culture, they had to adjust the actual poster um, of the movie from you know the left to what you see on the right, which I thought was Kind of interesting also. Um, so with all that said, these companies that are huge companies, I mean, it kind of boggles me how, how many of these big companies have made translation mistakes and didn't do their due diligence and, and research. So um, these are just a couple funny examples. There's actually a website called English.com. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. Um, you should check that out. It, it's really funny stuff. You're laughing at using that. Right. You know, menus and things that are poorly translated. Um, but I try to find some more, you know, appropriate examples. And, and basically, um, so KFC was going into Asia, and you know, the finger licking good slogan was translated in, in a way where it says "Eat your fingers off." <laughs> the uh, Pepsi, the, the next generation, you know, it brings you to life. It, it translated in. China as Pepsi brings your ancestors back to life. So, you know, you can have some Pepsi and that happens, I guess. Walking, walking dead. <laughs> um, and Gerber, the baby food. Um, so that, not just like the marketing slogans and the text, it also could be a product and company name. Uh, when going into Africa and French speaking nations, I guess Gerber also means to vomit. So they had to change it to be under the Nestle brand. So, you know, these are humorous things, but could cause a lot of ill will with a company and kind of embarrass them. So, you know, just something to keep in mind that, uh, like I said, translation is usually kind of comes in later on in the process, the last thing you want to do, but it can have some really bad, you know, consequences. So localization also could, you know, revolve around things like, like color and numbers. Um, so different colors can mean different things, or red might be Christmas or positive things. Um, it could mean communism in certain countries. White, you know, when it's kind of like innocence and purity could also mean death in other countries. So, you know, these are things that marketers need to be mindful mindful of when they're developing marketing campaigns. Um, you know, the use of how much color is used and things like that. Numbers, and this is something that's new to me. I didn't know this about the number 17. Uh, basically, in, it's unlucky in Italy, and 13 is lucky. I'm not sure why. But it is considered lucky, but the number 17 is considered unlucky because um, I guess in the Roman the way it's spelled out, the Roman numerals, it was put on tombstones and it meant, you know, BC, past tense, <coughs> I lived. So 
it, it translates to basically your debt if you use that number in Italian. It, it, it has kind of a bad connotation. Uh, and the number four is considered unlucky in China, Korea, some Asian markets. Um, just very superstitious, but in Japanese, the way it's pronounced, um, you know, project manager told me it, it means death too. So it's basically you have to be careful um, with how you're using numbers and colors and things. You don't want to offend a culture. You want to appeal to a culture and speak kind of you know their language. Um, so that's all I had for an intro. I know I talk a lot, so I'm going to pass it on to Mike, and then I get into more specifics on what goes into the, the translation process. Thank you. So Nick is giving you a great overview of, and I hope what you've taken away from it is, the range of careers and the range of, of options there are in the language industry. Uh, so it goes beyond what you might have envisioned. If you didn't know much, you might think, well, a translator, you sit at a desk, you do some translation. And, uh, you know, whatever it says in Spanish, you make that English, or whatever it says in English, you make that Spanish, or whatever your source of target languages are. I think Nick has dispelled that notion quite well. You can see that in this uh, intensely globally interconnected world we have, um, there's a, a very wide range of career options for people who know other cultures. Is there anyone here who thinks that knowledge of other cultures and languages is not that important? I didn't think so, especially not in this group. So uh, maybe not everyone in this country understands that yet, but uh, uh, there's a lot better understanding than there was several years ago. So uh, Nick has given the great 20,000 foot uh, survey of the battlefield. I'm going to take you down in the trenches. And uh, as a person who does translation work all day long, I've also worked in the agency setting, done some of the, the work, uh, kind of work that Nick has described. So I'm f familiar with a lot of aspects of it. And uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention career-wise, if, if your love is translation like it is for me, love of language and love of translation, these types of careers also are a great stepping stone. Working through an agency, working in areas of localization, uh, working in all these aspects, leveraging your cultural knowledge and your linguistic knowledge can be the stepping stone uh, to a career in translation that uh, most people in the translation business tend to kind of work their way into it from some other area of uh, that uh, field or even some totally different area of industry. And they kind of build up their clientele on one side uh, while they're working, uh, say, doing desktop publishing or doing uh, working as a consultant for localization and so forth. So keep that in mind, that the, the range of opportunities out there for careers is really much wider, I think, than, than you may realize. As far as the, the translation approach, uh, well, localization, as, as Nick said, it's the, it's the idea of, of going beyond simple translation. Most of what I do nowadays uh, is technical translation. So, uh, you know, I get something like, in, that says in German, uh, this patient has grade three tricuspid valve regurg regurgitation. And in technical translation, that's the only thing you want to communicate what the patient has. There's none of this, this patient has grade three tricuspid valve regurgitation. <laughs> no, no extra added meaning <laughs> hidden in the presentation, nothing else. But uh, what Nick has described in the localization, it goes way beyond that. You're looking at the uh, meaning, levels of meaning, at uh, uh, many different levels of meaning. So uh, just a couple of concepts you should be aware of. So localization, this idea of taking a product, taking all aspects of the product and adapting it to uh, the target cultures, the places where you want to market it or where you want it read, where you want exposure for it. Um, and translation is just a small part of that. Uh, it might even, uh, well, it's a critical part of it, but it might not even be the biggest part. You've seen the, the list of tasks that, that uh, uh, Nick enumerated. Um, also, uh, another uh, thing that's bandied about quite a bit is also globalization and internationalization. Um, they're two slight, these are slightly different processes. Uh, globalization is kind of the idea of starting out from the very beginning and, and interla internationalization with a little bit of a shading. Starting out from the very beginning with the idea that whatever you're doing is going to go out there internationally, it's going to be used internationally. So you get rid of from the beginning the things that could waste you time and money 
in developing your product and in, in marketing it. You get, you know, you make sure the baseball references are not in there. You make sure that that uh, uh, objectionable colors and images and so forth. That uh, you know, you you're thinking about that from the very beginning. So globalization and internationalization focus more on on those uh, those approaches. So. Getting down into the uh, trenches about translation, if you're actually working on translation and the, the language aspect of it. So technical translation, as I said, you're looking at usually one level of meaning because that's what effective technical language is, technical writing is. You, you want to communicate one idea as clearly and, and objectively as possible. Um, I use the example of literary translation. I lifted a lot of these slides from a presentation I did uh, on marketing translation, but uh, all of this is analogous and uh, ap ap applies to localization. Um, so uh, e these simple concepts, you want consistency at one level of meaning, literary translation or, and the same applies to translation for localization or marketing, there's a lot of things going on at a lot of different levels you have to be aware of. Only people who are aware of the cultures and, you, and the source and target culture have a very good knowledge of those things. Uh, more than just the language are going to be able to spot and, and recognize those things. So, uh, and as a, as a translator, you may find your most difficult task is to decide if there's three things going on in this text, I can't capture them all in the target language. So, which ones are the most important? And so you saw in the, like some of the examples, uh, uh, you know, it's not the most important thing in the picture is not which vegetable, it's that the child is rejecting it. So you can figure out which aspect of that is the most important. So you have to think about the text. You have to think about what you're doing on several different levels, not just that uh, this word means that in the, the target language. So uh, uh, I, I quoted a few things in my uh, earlier presentation also from a, a, a great uh, marketing presentation that was done in Chicago at the, the conference, at the ATA conference. And these are some, some things to think about. And again, this is, uh, this is analogous to pretty much to all aspects of localization. But uh, I do some tra a lot of translation for marketing as well. And I also do editing for marketing, where I'll take somebody's translation and I will go through and edit it for a marketing text. And my goal is to achieve exactly this. So I may get a perfect translation from the person who did it before that has all the meaning, but doesn't capture some of the other elements and won't have the right impact. In German, for instance, they take a very dry, high-level approach. Uh, uh, it's very, um, very much more reserved as far as pitching a product and, and how you address your customer. Your, your customer. There's more distance, it's a little bit more formal. You know how advertising is in the United States. It's like we're, we're right down in your face, they're treating you like you're five years old, they're really telling you you've got to have this thing. So you've got to capture that. If you want this to be effective for your client, you've got, to, you've got to capture that in the target. And everything I say here is, most of it is going to be about translation into English because that's the direction I work. But if you're working from English into another language, flip this over. You're going to be thinking about these same ideas or these same things that you have to think about when you're translating into, say, Spanish, Portuguese, French, whatever your target language may be. Um, it, uh, there will be analogous problems no matter which two languages you're, you're working with. So that's all fairly self-explanatory. If, if you don't sell the meaning to your end customers, your, your, your work has failed. The, the uh, marketing agency has failed, your translation has failed, and uh, nobody's happy. So uh, this, uh, we, can, we can skip this pretty well. You know what types of marketing texts, uh, but I, I think Nick's examples were much better about what, it, what is out there that needs to be localized. Um, so here's this dichotomy that you, you will run into if you work in this, uh, in this area. Uh, as a translator, uh, we're trained to do these things. We faithfully convey a source message. We're not supposed to add anything or take anything out. It's got to be... Uh, we, we are supposed to render as faithfully as possible what's there in the source and respect the style and tone. If it's bad, I've had many translations where the source text was not that great. I'm not supposed to improve on it. It's not my job as a translator, technical translation. However, the marketer, those are the marketer's goals. 
developing the marketing campaign, promoting the product, service, or idea, setting the style or tone. Now you've got to think differently from the way you would if you were a technical translator. If you are doing marketing, if you're doing localization, if you are adapting for another culture, you've now got to think about all these things, and those may overrule some of the, <coughs> these concepts, these sort of core ethical concepts that uh, we have as translators. So it's a different kind of work. It's a different way of looking at what we do as, as language professionals. And uh, not that you will run rogue <laughs> and do whatever you want. You're going to be in consultation with whoever you're working with. And uh, uh, you're going you're gonna to be talking with them about how you adapt what you do to make it more effective. Uh, this idea of transcreation, this, this is thrown out a lot in, in marketing, uh, uh, translation, translation for marketing. So, um, Gregor and Samsa, uh, uh, Clark and Gregor, I mean, Samsa, Gregor Samsa. <laughs> Metamorphosis, right? <laughs> um, you know, the guy who turned into a cockroach, too. So I know it's a something Freudian there. Uh, so, it's this idea that you're doing more, you're adding something else to the translation work. You're doing more than just conveying the words from one language to another. You're trying to catch as many levels, if not all of the levels, when you, when you uh, transfer the text into the target language. So you may see that term transcreation in connection with localization, in connection with any kind of work in, in marketing. Um, just a few tips. And you're not going to remember any of this probably in two weeks, but I hope what you will take away from, from what's said here is the depth and breadth of what there is to know about this. Uh, that there, there is a lot going on in this kind of work, there's a lot going on in this industry, and I hope that that will stimulate you to co continue to dig into it and see what part of it might be for you. But as far as translation skills, uh, for marketing for U.S., and again, flip this. If, you were, if we were talking English to German, it would be the other way around. So think about this. Think about these things as I put them up, how they would differ maybe if you're going from English into another language. For translation into English, for uh, marketing, we want to keep it simple and conversational. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't read pedantic ads in, in American English, do you? They're, they're, they want to be chatty. They want to be quick. Um, so. Your source might say something like implemented through the use of, this, you know, I would, I, would, I would translate it as produced using. Optimal, you see you get this word a lot. It's a, you, you see this form of it in all sorts of other, in uh, so many other languages that the, there's this like, desire to translate it as optimal in English because we do have that word. You would never see that in an ad though, probably, unless they really wanted that effect. Perfect. Um, the flexibility, use the flexibility of your, whatever your target language is. In English, I find so many translators neglect this wonderful function of English, of using the progressive form. And since it's simple present tense in the source, they'll render it in simple present tense. In English, product X opens new horizons. It's exactly what, say, the German said. But isn't that how we really say it? Product X is opening new horizons, and so you'll have the same. Now you you know going into Spanish, you might not use those ando forms quite. They don't use them quite so much as we do, but uh, so you might have the same problem of having to reduce these to get that same feel in whatever your target language is. But it's 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 a matter of thinking about more than just the words and the meaning of the words and a one for one translation. English is. I did a talk. Uh, some years ago about verbing in uh, translation, and that's that English is a very verbal language, whereas a lot of other languages will use nouns to convey, especially German. But even Spanish, a lot of times, it'll be one noun loaded on top of another. And in English, we do a lot of that with verbs and, and verbal forms. And you'll find if you go through your translation and start flipping those nouns, some of those nouns into verbal forms, you suddenly get a very nice, flowing, well-reading target. So, just some things to think about. You can apply this pretty much to most translation 
um, kind of avoiding the literalness of, of translation. So, uh, you know, can you leave something out? A lot of the Russian always will say the company blah blah blah, the company this, the company that, the company GE, the company this. We just say GE, right? We just say acting. Um, any, all, I love this, any, all, some, many, think about those. We see, we, we see todo, 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 and we put all, 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 all. Well, no, sometimes any, sometimes it, it means the same thing, doesn't it? And it, it sounds better, it sounds better to our ear. Adjective positioning, great thing about English, we can also do post-positioning and pre-positioning, which gives us great flexibility. Getting to the point, um, it's often worth it in translation into English to break sentences up, make them short. We Americans don't have great attention spans, do we? So <laughs> it's good to keep it short. Uh, Germans like, you know, they can, well, if you know German, you've got to be able to concentrate because the sentences are very long and the verb that you need is at the very end of it, usually. <laughs> so they have to concentrate. This is the cardinal rule of translation, though, in my mind. If you reread your translation work, you read, read what, what you've done, thinking about what the target is, what the intended use of it is, if it sounds funny to you, it probably sounds funny to everybody else. You've got to, you've got to find a way, develop a technique for isolating what it is in that sentence that doesn't sound right, that doesn't feel right, and then look at it. Then go back to the references, go back and see well, is, is what, what is not right about this. And usually you'll find, you can, you can zero in on that, and you could, you'll discover what it is that, you know, that word, oh yeah, well the word means this 90% of the time, but in this case it means something else. So if you don't remember anything else, that's a good one to remember. And poetic license, if you're translating for localization or uh, marketing or anything else, um, English is a wonderfully flexible language, and you, you use that, you know. And oh, that's it. So, I think we were to Q and A. Indeed. Well, there's. Any questions for Nick or for Mike? Um, just the fact that as like culture constantly changes, like dynamic. How do you guys like keep up? With, I guess the changes that are happening. One, well, you guys do not realize how lucky you are to live in this time. When I started translating in the 1980s, there was no internet. We would beg anybody who was going to Europe or going abroad to bring back some magazines, please, and any manuals and catalogs and anything else they could bring so we could see exactly what was used. Now we have this wonderful internet where you can read newspapers. If I want to see what's happening in Germany, I can go read the German newspaper. If I want to read French, I can go read the French newspapers. Serbia, whatever, of any of the languages that we're in. And all of that material is out there. And uh, what was the great example we were talking about? The pink is the new black. Right. So uh, in a, trying to come up with some kind of marketing idea about that, you might have to do more research, but the material is out there on the internet, and you can find out what, what do these other cultures say that is sort of analogous to this 40 is the new 30, um, Porsche is the new VW, I don't know, whatever. You know, how do they say that? How do they do that? And you can leverage those resources. There, there is a tremendous amount of wonderful source material in, in uh, all of the major world languages and, and a lot of the, the minor ones as well. So that's the best resource. But read all you can that's source written in the, the language that you work in, in, in your source language. At Interpro, just to... Well, because we have the translators in the countries, but they're native speakers, they're, they're up to date with what's going on, the common terminology, the common trends. Um, some things might not translate, you know, like, like I think there's a new bag example, a really good one, um, or it's a new tool, things like that. But there's always new technologies coming out, and you know, we kind of adapt as our clients are adapting the, the how they're changing the English. We have to you know, kind of go from there. 
Yeah, I had a question about your translators. Um, sure. You said they were professional linguists, but are, do you have translators that are full-time in the company, on call, or do you require any kind of special certification? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the way we're structured at our company, um, we have native-speaking project managers that have uh, certifications or backgrounds in being a translator. Uh, but they don't do any translation work. They might do some spot checking. Um, the reason they have to be native speakers is because um, an experienced translator, they understand the process. So they're managing a project, the client comes to them. Um, the way we work is actually we have partner companies in each country that handle the language work. And they, those are the translators. Like in Germany, we have basically kind of like an equivalent of Interpro that is what we call an SL, a single language vendor. They just do the German translation work. They have the 30, 40 German translators under one roof um, that have subject matter expertise. There's translation, editing, and proofreading being done. Um, so we have this kind of established network. Mm -hmm. And in each country, they kind of have their own equivalent certification. So like in, if you're a US translator, the ATA, American Translator Association, which are like the other ones. Um, in Canada, there's like a Quebecois, traducteur. So, so every country kind of has their own, um, and that that's kind of how we handle it. And we're, you know, we have a, we've been around for a while, so we have pretty good established networks um, to work for us. The qualifications need they have to be in the country. They have to have um, editing and proofreading as part of the process. They have to be able to use the translation memory technology and tools. Um, so that's kind of how we have to that. The partners. Mm -hmm. um, we own our own office in Rosario, Argentina. They do the most of our Spanish work, but they are not our employees. Um, we support them. Same thing with China. Our China office for simplified Chinese. They're not our employees, but we support. We pay for their licenses. We pay for their, you know, mm -hmm. uh, computers, things like that. So mm -hmm. a little more control over those, but um, yeah. Give yeah, a long answer. Hopefully, I answered it. No, yeah, just a, a little bit about certification in the United States. So, uh, we do have the American Translators Association, so um, where you can uh, become certified in a number of languages, but not all languages. They don't provide, unfortunately. Yes, but that's a that's a professional association. It's a very well respected credential, and probably everybody here works in what what languages do we have? Spanish and English, Portuguese. Portuguese, Chinese. French, Chinese. Russian, Chinese. Russian, Chinese. 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 So certification, certification in Chinese is only English to Chinese right now. They're trying to develop Chinese to English. But the other languages that we're mentioning here, they have certification for that. It's a very good tool, but we don't have as not as well established a system as you see in other parts of the world where you can get certification through uh, higher institutes of higher education and so forth. Um, do you have any idea how someone is certified for sign language, like American Sign? I, I don't. There has to be some kind of yeah, yeah, there is, there there is, trade yeah. association. <laughs> and a lot of the translators, too, have, you know, they have to be bilingual, and then they're, they have degrees in translation, mm -hmm. so they go to school. And one of the reasons we picked Rosario, Argentina, is so there's a lot of translation, like universities, there's like a, like a mm -hmm. you know, a bed for that. So, um, yeah, there, there has to be something for that. I unfortunately, I don't know. Um, you mentioned uh, for Argentina how you guys have the office. Um, in terms of localization, um, if you're if you have a client whose market is let's say Mexico, although it's Spanish, um, right. do, would they still take care of it in Argentina? Great question. So the way we we don't do a lot of just Mexican Spanish because usually if it's the U.S. audience, they do. Cut. There's not really a universal Spanish, but it's kind of generic enough where they can understand it. Uh, but I do have a client that they, they want to target Mexico. Mm -hmm. So the way our process works is um, we have a partner in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and before we start working with them, the, the previous process was we translate in Argentina and then have like an editor and a proofreader for, for Mexican Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now we actually have a, a, a partner in Mexico that we work with. So it could be a mix, um, but you know, it's. Um, Unless they're just marketing to Mexico, we try to recommend more Latin American because you can kind of get more bang, you know, for, for what you're investing in. Um, obviously, European Spanish is a different kind of animal, so, um, but that's how we handle it. Um, they want to uh, <laughs> no, sir. Oh, so, yeah. 
Okay, sure. No How about um, targeting Latinos in the U.S.? How do you determine what a native speaker is for that demographic? That's it's also um, a really good question, and it's hard because you know some some areas of the U.S. would be Mexican, Spanish. Some would be Cuban, Latin America. Um, we tend we have found that the Latin American Spanish the way our we we basically inform our translators that this is for the U.S. market and they are going to try to, to translate and keep it as general as possible because here's the thing there could be multiple ways to translate the same thing and it might be accurate but there's kind of a joke and you guys heard like it's like do you get five translators the same translation they might give you five different ways to translate it it's all accurate but it's you know um so that that's kind of how, how we handle it it hasn't posed a problem yet. Uh, we do a lot of work for training. Um, so we do work with some restaurant companies like Domino's and um, some other ones where they have to train their employees in the U.S. in Spanish. And so we, we, we help with the translation and it hasn't caused any issues yet. I was curious about what piqued both of y'all's interest into this whole world of translation. Like was it a class or was it like somewhat like a place that you visited, um, like what, I mean, why did you decide to go into translation? Um, I kind of fell into it uh, when I was, my father was uh, lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and so we were trans we moved around a lot when I was small. We lived in Germany when I was from five to seven years old, and, uh, but I really didn't have much exposure to learning foreign languages and until I got to college. I, I had some, but you know, I, it, it was never a focus of anything. And uh, I, it wasn't very well developed in high school. So when I got to college, I, I took, I was a psychology major, I took German just to meet the language requirement and I, I, because I had to live in Germany. And I, I enjoyed it so much, I liked it. Uh, the professor there said, well, if you like German, try Russian. <laughs> and then I tried Russian, and I really liked that. And I went from there, and uh, as we uh, was talking recently, it's, I, I happened to find the thing that I really enjoy and uh, that I'm good at. Uh, and that's probably true for many of you as well. Uh, but it's just, for me, it's like I play all day long. I work in multiple languages, uh, in English, and to me, it's, it's the most fun thing I could ever do in my life. To me, it's like solving puzzles, uh, decoding things. If you're that kind of person, you know, the, the language industry is, uh, uh, translation is, is a great place to be. So that's, that's kind of how I, I became interested in it. Yeah, I grew up um, bilingual house when I was from Italy. So I grew up speaking Italian and uh, learning English at the same time. Um, I admired in French in college and was always kind of interested in marketing, so that's kind of what it started. Thank you. Sorry, I work professionally, uh, I work in, uh, I'm ATA certified German to English, and Russian to English. I also translate French to English, Spanish to English, Italian to English, Dutch to English, Serbian to English, Croatian to English. Um, I can do light translation, like birth certificates and personal documents in Bulgarian, Macedonian, and Czech. Uh, I've studied a little Japanese. I also studied Soviet Georgian, but I can I, I know enough Japanese to get myself in trouble in Japan. <laughs> uh, in Georgian, I've forgotten most of that. But So I probably work in a eight or nine languages to, to English. But as I said, I love it. it it's, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's, it's fun, you know. And the more languages you learn, the easier it becomes. It's really true. So once you decided you actually liked translating, how did you actually get into it? Like, how did you actually start off working in translation? Um, the first translation I did was I was about to graduate from the University of Arizona, and I, I did a little technical translation for somebody in the, one of the departments. But, uh, Really, I was casting around for what to do when I went to that other school over in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. I went there for my master's degree in <laughs> Slavic linguistics, and, and uh, I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> that was not nice what you guys did to us. <laughs> um, so uh, I studied in Yugoslavia for a year, and I came back. I had I had done some 
freelance translation work for an agency, a local agency, and I came back there was a vacancy in that agency, and much uh, one very similar to uh, what Nick has. And so I began working on that, and, uh, uh, and it was a great setting because it gave me a setting where I could learn, I could really learn my trade. And then I, uh, some partners set up a company that we ran for about 20 years, which was the same thing, I learned the business side, but I also had an opportunity to do translation work. And when the time came and I was ready, I didn't want to run a small business anymore, I made the transi transition to become a freelance translator. And, and uh, So for many of you, that may be the, the route you take. You may start off doing one thing. I met a very enterprising person, at, and it was in Chicago again at the ATA, who, uh, she is from Brazil originally, but uh, had this very clear idea of what she wanted to do. And that was, she was going to you know, finish her degree, she was going to go to work for an agency, she was going to basically get herself, build up her skills, develop her translation skills, and up to the point where she was ready to then become a freelance translator. And about uh, seven or eight months after the conference, I got an email from one of my regular clients from this very young woman who had landed a job with that company. <laughs> and so she was working on her plan and taking it step by step. So, you know, a lot of times the most direct approach uh, can be very frustrating in translation. Just, you know, leaving college and setting up shop, you don't have experience, you don't have the clients, it's very hard. It's, it's often better to look at all the opportunities and things that there are out there and kind of work your way. You know, have the goal, but work your way there. Um, uh, I think sh you first and then you. Okay. Uh, something that I'm personally curious about with so many languages that you work in, I'm currently at about functionally, I'm functionally in about five, um, and I'm working up to around nine or ten, as, like you are. Um, how do you keep all the languages separate? Because that's something that I've been struggling with very much. Um, so I'm, I was curious about that. Yeah, John and I have talked a lot about this. It's very, it, it, I actually really enjoy paying attention to what happens in my brain when yeah. I shift gears. Because, you know, I might do three or four jobs in Serbian, and then the next thing I get will be Italian. And there's, I, there's like a ramp-up process where it's almost like you can feel in your brain, it's like shifting things around, moving the furniture around to get the Italian stuff up to the front. All of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, some short period of time into the project, it will click into place, and it's all there again. I don't know, you know, I'm not a scientist, I don't know why, maybe it doesn't work that way for everybody else, but for me there is this kind of ramp up time of switching from one language to the other. Yeah. yeah but I, I, I love it. I mean, it's, it's just, when it, it you know, when it, it suddenly it becomes as, you know, as clear as water, mm -hmm. then, uh, it, in fact, there are times when I look at a document and it takes me a few minutes to realize that I haven't even thought about what language it's in. <laughs> that, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm reading the meaning of it, and then I have to stop and think, oh, you know, it's French, or it's... Yeah. It just, you just, you just yeah. know what's there. For me, it's like a 10 or 15 minute interval while I, I can't create language until I realize what language I'm speaking. It's, mm. like, it's my, it's sort of like a uh, obstacle where it's like, I have to figure out how to create this language and the structure before I can actually get into the language. Yeah, you'll find the more familiar you are with the language too, uh, the, 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 when you're not so familiar with them, they tend to blur together. So mm -hmm. oddly, I would mix French and Russian together. <laughs> with If I was searching for a word in Russian, sometimes a French word would come up. Mm -hmm. But I never mixed German with anything because German's the language I had the most facility in. But then as my Russian got better, I didn't. But then when I lived in Yugoslavia, I would mix the Serbian and Russian together. And then by the end of the time in, in Yugoslavia, when my Serbian was very good, then I would, I would, if I tried to speak Russian with someone, I would mix the Serbian word in. So it just, you know, it all gets kind of jumbled. But eventually, I think when you reach a certain level of facility, your brain will separate them out. When you're learning a new language, do you find it difficult? Like, when did you learn them? I know it's easier if you start learning as a child or if you're fully immersed in an area that speaks that language. Is that what you did, or do you find it easier, like with like Spanish is similar to Italian? Uh, your, yes. The languages you speak yeah. seem to well, be really different. Well, I'm trained as a linguist, so I look for those patterns in language, and the Romance languages are wonderful because they they have some linguistic changes from one to the next, but the, the structure of, it, of them is all very similar. Um, but uh, I, I should make a distinction here too between passive and active knowledge. Many of the languages I work in. Uh, I read them fluently, but I can't really speak them. I have difficulty 
getting around in that language in the, in the country because that's a low level everyday active knowledge that has to really be active. <coughs> but the passive knowledge the ability to read and, and to read fluently and understand what's there is, is, is different. So the, you know, those, two, those two skills are really two different things. So the skill you need as an interpreter, for instance, you need absolute fluency in both languages. And, and I don't have that. It's possibly in German. But, uh, but um, you know, that, that active knowledge is, is very different from, and that I think you gain best probably when you're young, but I think you can learn it any time. Um, yeah. Maybe not quite as easy. Um, when you're learning a new language, um, Actually, you just said that you don't really speak as much as you would read and write, but how do you work on developing your pronunciation for the language? Because at times, like, where you're learning, because I'm in Russia now, I, I, like, butcher the pronunciation all the time. And I was just wondering, how do you, like, learn and develop that skill so you kind of sound like a more natural speaker? Are you a musician by any chance? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I find that really helps me. Uh, uh, I just try to listen to all aspects, and as a linguist too, I got some training at university in how we make the different sounds that we have, you know, a fricative versus an affricate versus, a, you know, all of the, the technical words, and so it made me stop and think about the hardest thing is sounds that you don't have in your native language is we, we don't even hear them at a certain point, you know, after a certain age, you don't hear those sounds. And so you have to sort of train yourself to be able to listen to those things. Like uh, uh, in some languages, they can't tell the difference between t and th. But it's very obvious to those of us who speak English or have grown up speaking English. And, and it's an important distinction. So you have to kind of train your ear to listen and to mimic those sounds as, as well as you can. And, and be aware that there may be some things that you can't hear. Mm -hmm. If I can chime in real quick. I think if you're really serious about learning a language, you need to go there. If you have the opportunity to study abroad, I'm sure Duke has kind of programs like that. No, I didn't do that with French, with French, and I really regret it. Um, but when I did go to France, um, you're you're forced to speak the language, and, and I've heard if you could go for three or six months where you're there, you have no choice. So you're you're you know I'm sure people speak English, but if you guys are really serious about learning a language, I would definitely recommend looking into that. Now would be the time to do it. Um, it, it would really really help you guys because uh, you have to. You're there. You're kind of conversing with people, you're meeting people, you're going to stores, you're going to restaurants. I think that would be um, a really good opportunity if you guys have that opportunity to look into that. And one other thing along those lines, um, you know, when I was learning language and studying in Germany, I was so f focused and fixated on speaking perfectly and without an accent and getting all, and I didn't want to talk unless I was sure I wasn't going to make a mistake. Don't do that. <laughs> Just get out there and talk. They don't care if you make mistakes. You know, people, people are amazingly patient if you're trying to learn their language. But the most important thing is to use it and then listen to what comes back to you and adjust based on, on what you hear. So you know, don't be afraid to get out. When I was at the hotel in France, I was speaking and I was really nervous. I was speaking French at the hotel. Like, hey, word, how do I get to this you know, mine or whatever? And I was speaking in French and I was like, they did, and then they responded in English, oh, your French is very good. <laughs> so I was like, thanks. I didn't know. Um, we talk about in class um, some of the different online tools like dictionaries or like we use Lingue a lot. Um, like as professional translators, whether it's you or whether it's your staff at Interpret, like how, you know, it's like the point of being, I guess like you're a professional, so like do you not need to use those tools or do you rely on those tools heavily to kind of look at what's out there? You use everything you can possibly use, but you have got to understand the limitations of all of them. Like Lingue is, it gives you lots of great options, but a lot of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to be able to tell when it gives you something that doesn't sound, my rule about sounding right, you know, that doesn't sound right. right. It doesn't fit. And the same for most online resources. I still have a bank of dictionaries behind me in my office at home that I re that I refer to because I know that's vetted terminology. And I'll double check. I'll cross reference uh, for terminology just because just because I found a site on the internet that might be somebody else's translation and it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to. You, it's a, they're great resources. I would never want to translate without the internet. But you've got to know its limitations, and you've got to know where to go to be sure that what you're, you're doing is right. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've seen some translators, but a project manager that he also was a French translator, and he had the Theodore Robert book, you know. <laughs> so I think it, it, it kind of preference. I think they use every resource you can, and and always ask the companies that need, you know, if someone comes to me for a translation, you know, provide as much reference material as possible. You know, if you have a website, an additional brochure, um, give it a little more context. Like, don't just give us a sentence to translate. You know, um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's very helpful. So. Does someone like check the work that you do, or is there like someone that you ask for editing or proofreading? Yeah, that's pretty standard practice <coughs> that, uh, in the industry. That uh, you have one person doing the translation, and you'll have at least one person then editing it. So I also do a lot of editing and proofreading of other people's translations. And sometimes there's a third layer. You know, the agents, especially in the case of localization, uh, Nick probably does this, where you'll have a also a final proofreader who will check the, the quality. Of the and a lot of times we look at it in its final environment too. So there's translation editing, and then also like a final, we call it like an online QA or an e-learning validation or a post desktop publishing QA where the translator will go and look at the English and then the final like Spanish product and like go and make sure it looks good. Um, so usually the more steps in the process, the better. It's very dangerous not to do that because yeah. even the best translate. I mean, I've looked at some stuff that I've done before, or I've seen the corrections come back in the error. What did I? What was I thinking? So no matter how good you are, there's there's always a chance you're going to miss something, and, and an editor or a proofreader will take care of that. So is there anything that you don't like about either the job itself or the industry, or something that you're hoping is going to change in the coming years? Um, what I don't like is this, and I don't like it in our society in general, is this, this, this race to the bottom as far as pricing and everything else. Uh, this, this idea that my work is worth something but nobody else's is. And basically, the truth is you get what you pay for. And there's a lot of competition in our industry now to drive prices down. And it's a simple equation. To make a living wage, you need to be able to make a certain amount of money. Now, if they're paying you less per word, for what you do, then you can't make, you have to process more words. So if you have, are having to process more, wor more work now to make the same standard of living, you're not going to pay as much attention to it. You're going to have to get it out. Mm -hmm. So, and we see this happening in all aspects of our society and our lives, I'm afraid. This, and, you know, we all want everything faster and cheaper, but actually, you know, that's not really the road to quality and, and satisfaction. So, especially in translation, it's an intellectual profession. It's uh, something that demands uh, people have got to have time to think about what they're doing. They, you know, they, they, they can't do it for free. None of us can work for free. But you know, in order to do a good quality job, you know, we, we've got to be paid properly and we've got to have the time to do it carefully. If we start rushing through it, that's when the mistakes happen. And uh, so that's, the, that's probably the thing that I like least is I, you know, I have kind of two tiers of clients for myself. Some are very professional, like Nick's organization. Will uh, they, they really understand that you need to pay people properly for this work? But there is this business uh, tension about cost and um, uh, service and quality. But that you you know, you can't do this work right. But I also have clients who say you're doing great work for us, Mike. Now would you please lower your rate from X to Y? And I say you know I'm fortunate to be in the position to say. No, why would I do that? I have enough work that I'm not, you know, why do I want to process your work? I'll do worse job on your work because I'm not getting paid as much than I will for my other client who pays me more. And that's the situation. So, you know, saving a few pennies in the short run usually is, is a, not a recipe for success. And that's, I think, the only part that I don't like about the industry. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's very... It's not commoditized. It's getting better because I think companies are doing translation wrong, and so it's kind of like it's the last thing usually in the process. So I developed the website, I developed the marketing brochure, not to translate it, no big deal. I mean, unless they've done it before and been through the process, they might not know what goes into it, all the steps. So you know, there's Google Translate for websites. It's free. Um, so actually, we we that's what I don't like as well is 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 if I'm putting this part of my job, I'm looking to get new clients to help. And, and you know we have a good company in promote and we're, we're very partnership and solutions oriented so I always like to talk with our clients and hear what potential clients what do they really need like how could we help them and sometimes you don't get that opportunity to even have that conversation it's like okay here's an email oh I need 10,000 words translated 
you know, if, you, if they don't even give you the chance to talk and kind of explain it, then you're kind of already at a disadvantage. So um, I actually brought some of our marketing collateral and we have some swag out there. <laughs> and one of the parts in the collateral, the whole point we did, the, one of the main reasons we did this, this is brand new um, from the fall, is there's a section in here called invest. There's a big difference between an expense and an investment. Accurate, effective communications keep your customers coming back. So um, a big part of this was kind of to get people to think like, okay, translations, I mean, you have to do it, but look at it as an investment. If you do it properly, it's going to help your brand and help your customers. And it's not all about sales and global. I mean, there's a lot of companies that we help that they're trying to train workers. And some of it's like sensitive stuff. Like we did a, a course for a forklift operator in Spanish. I mean, if you translate that, you know, that, that is life or death. Like mm -hmm. it, it could be that intense. So um, I'll pass these around if you guys would like them. Uh, feel free to take them. Um, I'll make my suitcase home a little less heavy. <laughs> and, um, and also, I'll just throw this out there too. You know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if you guys are ever, you know, in the Chicago area, want to see Interpro's office, uh, we welcome you to, to meet. Um, if there's any way I can help you guys as you're thinking about careers, just bounce some advice. I'll be happy to, uh, you know, I have some business cards. I'll be happy to be a resource. Consider, you know, be a resource. And, and uh, if there's any way I can help you guys, and any any. There's no stupid questions, you know. About eight, eight or nine years out of school, so I know, definitely know what it's like. So just let me know. Thank you. Well, please um, join me in applauding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Questions and thanks all for coming. Thank you guys. Really great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, great questions.